We'd like to welcome everyone um, and to the second webinar of uh, the Community of Practice Ontology series. We are having four webinars this year, and this is the second one. Just to keep you uh, in, in touch with what we're doing here with the uh, Community of Practice of the Ontologies Group, it's actually part of a larger uh, big data platform, which is the CGIR Big Data Platform. We have a site within the larger website of the Big Data Platform, as you can see here. Um, we have recently set up a community on LinkedIn. Thirdly, we have a YouTube channel that has been set up, which will allow us to put these webinars onto the channel. And finally, uh, we will do our best to send a survey after this webinar. And this actually helps us to improve our webinars and also allowing you to provide other topics of interest that you may want to see in future webinars. Okay, so now let's start. We're going to have, uh, we have machine learning and ontology. We have three expert pa panelists, Milko Skofic, who is an expert in information systems design, data analysis, and capacity building, who will start us off. We have Xing Ji Song, research associate at the University of Sheffield, who will start putting together, um, bringing together machine learning and ontology topics. And then we will we'll end today with Diana Maynard, from C, who is a senior research fellow at Ulster from University of Sheffield, who will kind of continue on um, and, and bringing the topic of machine learning ontologies together and, and some examples there for us. And so I hand it over now to Milko. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hello. So my name is, is Milko Skofic, and I will be presenting a short general introduction to machine learning. So uh, we will first look at the different domains and the terminology which is associated with machine learning. What does machine learning mean? What makes it different from similar and related fields? Then we'll look at what are the different types and different applications of machine learning and the algorithms that are used to implement real world solutions. Finally, we will uh, talk about deep learning, which is an important offshoot of machine learning. So, the uh, central team term here is artificial intelligence. AI as an academic discipline was founded in 1956 and it incorporates and is related to many other disciplines. Artificial intelligence can be divided into two main categories. Weak or narrow AI is currently the most common applied artificial intelligence. Here, algorithms are trained to do just one specific task and they perform that task often better than humans. However, in order to perform a different task, these algorithms have to be trained all over again. Then we have generalized AI, which is the kind of stuff you see in movies. Think about Terminator, HAL. It is supposed to be able to handle any type of problem and adapt to different situations just as humans do. So in all of this, where does machine learning fit? To cite the person who coined the name, machine learning is a field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. It is the actual application of artificial intelligence to computers, which makes machine learning a branch of artificial intelligence. AI and ML, I'm using here the acronyms, are often used as synonyms, and this is mainly because most, if not all, applications of AI use computers. Machine learning has a lot in common with programming, and it has a lot in common with statistical modeling. So what are the differences in these different domains? So in traditional programming, it is the task of the programmer to anticipate and handle all the situations an application may encounter. In machine learning, the core idea is that the computer does not just use a predefined algorithm, but it teaches itself how to solve the problem. Machine learning is built upon a statistical framework. So these two fields or domain are closely related. Statistical modeling is mostly concerned about finding relationships between variables and what, what these relationships actually mean. It stresses interpretability. Machine learning, on the other hand, is mostly concerned about results of applying the model to data. It emphasizes prediction and optimization and it sacrifices interpretability to accuracy. Another popular term is data mining, and here the key message is large observational databases. 
Because in order to reach high levels of accuracy, uh, machine learning requires large amounts of observations and large amounts of variables. And this relates to the term big data. So what are the different activities of machine learning? Machine learning tasks can be divided into three main categories, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement learning. Um, supervised learning is a task-driven activity. Models are trained with examples of data which consist of data samples and then associated la labels. The term supervised comes from the fact that the labels usually need to be associated to data samples by human supervisor. The goal here is to train the model so that then it can correctly predict the label given a data sample. Unsupervised learning is data-driven activity. It, uh, that does not require the data to be labeled, it uh, rather ref infers the label uh, by trying to mine for rules and detect patterns and structure in the data. Finally, reinforcement learning is activity-driven or agent-driven. It can work with unlabeled or labeled data, and for this reason, some people call it semi-supervised learning. All reinforcement learning methods share the same goal. It's to solve sequential decision tasks using trial and error interactions with the environment. So, what kind of tasks can these three machine learning categories perform? So, we can divide supervised learning into two main tasks. Classification, which is the activity of predicting a categorical value. It learns how to classify data according to the provided training data. Then we have regression, which is the activity of predicting a continuous value. It creates a model which is used to forecast and predict trends. In unsupervised learning, uh, we have clustering, which makes sense of uncategorized data. It clusters the data points not according to a predefined classification, like in supervised learning, but according to what it discovers in the data. Dimensionality reduction reduces the number of features or variables needed to create a model and it finds the smallest but most relevant set of features that are needed to build a reliable model. So, what are the applications of machine learning? So, supervised learning is task-driven. It predicts classes or continuous values. Classification applications include uh, signature validation, face and object recognition, fraud detection, pattern recognition. Regression uh, is mainly handling forecasting and predictions. Some examples are prices forecasting, product demand, environmental data, process paramet parameter optimization, etc. Unsupervised learning is uh, data driven. It discovers patterns in and structures in data. Clustering activities include matching advertising to specific population groups or grouping information according to location, income, and other features. When we look at uh, dimensionality reduction, two important activities are high-resolution image compression and feature reduction, which uh, is used for minimizing training time in machine learning. And finally, in reinforcement learning, there are some applications such as speech recognition, writing recognition, games, robotics, driving, and flying. So, what are the algorithms that are used to implement these activities? Supervised learning uses a predictive model, a model trained with labeled data. Um, generative models attempt to fit a joint probability distribution and group observations around the center. Naive Bayes is an example. Discriminative models learn the conditional probability distribution. They create decision boundaries and the regression algorithms are, for instance, another example. Unsupervised learning uses descriptive model trained with unlabeled data. Uh, a popular clustering algorithm is k-means, where it organizes observations into clusters, and within a cluster, it minimizes the distance between observations, and across clusters, it maximizes it. Then we have dimensionality reduction, which reduces the number of features or parameters needed to build the model. And this is for, uh, for avoiding overfitting or to reduce computational costs. And a, a good example of, a, of an algorithm for this is principal component analysis. Finally, uh, reinforcement learning can use labeled or unlabeled data. 
And there are two main families. On the left, we have the Markov. This is a string rewriting system that uses a, a grammar-like rules to operate on lists or strings of symbols. In uh, evolutionary algorithms, uh, the idea is that uh, structures associated with good solutions can be mutated or combined to form even better solutions in following generations. And the genetic algorithm on the right, that's an, an example. Obviously, this list is not complete and there's a lot of other things uh, that there are going day after day, you have new uh, algorithms. And to conclude, I would like to introduce an offshoot of machine learning. So deep learning is a subdivision of machine learning. It can be unsupervised, partially supervised, or completely supervised. The main structures that uh, deep learning uses are deep artificial neural networks, which try to emulate the functions of inner layers of the human brain. We have here an example of a, a neural network. Its applications are image recognition, language translation, or email security. The main characteristic of deep learning is that it is capable of using a very large number of features or variables. And this is because the step of extracting the significant features is performed by the model itself. Deep learning has proven to be able to analyze and predict more accurately than humans. And this is because it's able to capture all the complexity of the environments in which everything affects everything else. But this may come at a price. I mean, we, we might have to give up our insistence on always understanding our world and widen the gap between knowledge and understanding. So on this note about knowledge and understanding, I would like to leave the floor to Shinji, who will bring machine learning into the world of ontologies. Thank you. Great, thank you. So I'm Shinji Song. So I will continue Melka's topic about talking about the machine learning in the ontology kind of building. So let's just start with simple example here. So when you see a brief text or sentence, something like the University of Sheffield is a public research university in Sheffield. Basically, you can build a simple ontology uh, based on this sentence. You can do something like the University of Sheffield is subclass of public research university and this is located in Sheffield. So if you want to build this in the fully automatic way or machine learning way, basically contain two major steps. So the first step is we call name entity recognition. You need to uh, find the entities inside of your sentence. So for example, here we have the University of Sheffield is an entity, the public research university and Sheffield is an entity. In next step, uh, something we call relation extraction or relation classification. So we need to find the relationship between these entities. So now I will just give you a very high level uh, overview of, of how this can be, can be done. So to do the uh, name entity recognition, um, basically we need to uh, classify each word in this sentence into the BIO labels. The B means beginning of the entity, I is inside of entity, and O is outside of entity. So after you classify these entities, you can group the B with I's and B is alone uh, as an entity. And the word in this case is represented by what we call features. The feature is, is can be like the word itself, uh, the word uh, preceding of this word and word after. Also, you can use kind of like part of speech to re represent this uh, word. And to train this model in the supervised way, so you need kind of human created, we call it golden standard label. So you compare with the uh, machine learning uh, prediction with the human standard label, you get the arrow, we call loss function, and you use this loss function, you calculate the gradient, you can use it guide uh, parameter update in the machine learning models. So for the uh, relation extraction, relation classification is basically very similar. Uh, the feature now is the representation of the source entity to target entity. And now the machine learning model or the classifier is trying to classify the relation uh, like either or located in or there is no relation. 
So once you've done this step, you can get your entities and their relationships. So you can uh, use some kind of simple program to group them into your ontologies. Once you have these kind of ontologies, they, they can also be used in many applications, such as here. Once you have this simple um, ontology on the right hand side, uh, you can ask in, in the search engine, you can ask who is the president of France? In that, instead of giving you a list of relevant pages, it will give you the answer uh, of, of your questions. Because in the ontology, it was said Macron is the president of France. So that, that's because the Macron is, uh, is the president of France, is already existed in the ontology. But if you ask some question like, where is the capital city of France? So this relationship is not existed uh, in the ontology. But we can do some kind of simple reasoning to find this relationship. Basically, we just need a reason like Macron is president of France and Macron live in Paris. Normally, like the president live in capital. So we can reason out the, um, the Paris is capital of France. So if you want to do it in the machine learning way, you just need to find the right path, uh, right path to the, to the uh, target entity that is the kind of relationship to the start entity. So basically how to do it is another kind of classification task. Now the feature here is the history of your path searching. For example, if you start at France, you want to find the, uh, the capital of relationship. Uh, so the feature can be represented by like the entity itself, uh, because this is start entity. And the output is the, what the next action, next action to do. For example, you can go to no answer, you can go to like other actions like Eiffel Tower is located in France. Uh, for example, now you go to the next uh, action, uh, you find that Macron is president of France. And then now the feature can be the start entity, the France, the relationship, and the current entity. Or you can use some kind of um, uh, history embedding method. And you use this predict next action until you find the right answer. So basically, if you want to do it in the supervised way, uh, you need human created label for each action. For example, from France, you need a human created label that guide you go to the president of and go to and then go to living in Paris. So that is pretty expensive process for creating this automatic machine learning approach. Instead of this, uh, you can see like Google, they provide a simple uh, user interface. You can just click, I might get the uh, right answer. If that is not correct, you can click there, the arrow or you can leave it as B. So we can transfer this kind of uh, method into the reinforcement. So now, uh, instead of human label in all actions, that is expensive and very difficult to create. So you ha now you have series of actions or your policies. You just ask user that is correct or not. If that answer is correct, you give reward, like give plus one reward. And if that is not correct, you give minus one reward, that is penalty or you reach to no answer, that is zero, no, uh, no penalty or no reward. And now instead of calculate the loss between human uh, and the machine learning model, now you try to maximize the expected reward. So, and you can use this uh, gradient in the, in the reward guide, the classifier update. So in this way, you get much, much cheaper annotation uh, for your machine learning model. And yes, there is such thing uh, as a free lunch that is unsupervised learning. So now I will introduce um, a word to VEC. So word to VEC is a, is a unsupervised learning uh, algorithm that often used in the ontology building. The idea is uh, the word, the meaning of the word normally can be expressed by the surrounding context, like God save the king or God save the queen. Uh, if someone don't even speak English, they can easily spot there is some kind of relationship between king and queen. So in the world to back, basically you just need uh, 
your input, now the feature input is, is king and represented by, we call one hot vectors, there are many zeros and ones. And the prediction, the output is, is con surrounding context and also represented by many zeros and ones. So the word vector is the uh, hidden layer in the neural networks. For example, here we say the king, we got the, the hidden layer as um, vector is 0 0.23, 0 0.1, and 0 0.55. If we put these uh, vectors into the, the axis, so you will find um, the magnitude and direction from the king to the queen is same magnitude uh, and direction from man to the woman. So we just do the simple math now. It's like the vector of king minus vector of man plus vector of woman, you will land into the vector of queen. So you can use this to do the verb tense things. And also, if you remember our last example, if you want to find the capital city of France, you just need I assume you know Madrid is the capital city of Spain. You just do Madrid minus Spain plus France, your land in Paris. So once you know some capital city of some country, you can get all the capital city of all countries. So I will stop here. I think uh, I will pass to Diana. She will talk about more about the work to back and the machine learning stuff in the ontology building. Thank you. Hi. So yes, I'm going to talk um, at a fairly high level about some uh, practical ways in which we've um, developed the ontologies in a project which is called NOMAC. So um, the problem here is we basically have um, policymakers in Europe and they want to answer questions like what is the innovation performance of France on climate change compared with Germany? So they have all kinds of questions related to knowledge production. Um, and we have on the other hand, um, as you see on the right hand side of the diagram, we have lots of data. So we have um, publications, we have projects, um, we have patents. We have websites, which all have lots of useful information. And the problem is essentially how to connect these things together so that we can answer these questions from the data. So we need to know what topics each document is talking about, which essentially is a problem of multi-class classification, and I'll come on to that. And the problem is we've got to somehow connect all these different topics together coherently. So um, in the science metrics field, um, the opportunities here basically are about trying to link different kinds of data sources in order to provide a richer view of knowledge production in Europe. And at the moment, this is a real problem that, um, that hasn't been solved. So the challenges for us are trying to find a robust approach in order to identify model relevant topics. Uh, language problems, so trying to connect different kinds of data. So projects, patents, publications, and so on, they have very, very different terminologies. So trying to match between the different ways in which they express um, the same ideas and the same topics is quite difficult. Uh, commensurability, so it's hard to connect different kinds of classifications. So there exist lots of hierarchies and ontologies and, um, and classification systems for patents, for projects, and so on. They all kind of have their own classification systems, but these don't connect together because they use different terms. And also, we need flexibility because these models change over time and space. So if we want to add a different kind of data, we again might have different kinds of terms. And terms change over time, and so do topics. And so does what's important to the policymakers. So here's an example of one of the things we're, we're trying to produce. So these are specialization indexes in biotechnology around Europe. So here we're comparing whether a country um, is producing more in the way of projects or patents or publications um, comparatively um, against, so we're comparing against different countries and uh, we're looking at the, the specializations in, in which one of these three kinds of data. Uh, here's another example. So here we're comparing patents and publications um, by country on a particular topic, which is waste management and recycling. So again, we can see some countries um, produce more patents, some countries produce more publications. The two things are very different. So again, we need, we're trying to connect the data together here. 
So, um, when we start from the beginning, we, um, we need to think about what kind of solutions we need for creating our ontology. So, essentially, we, we can start by considering whether we're going to build our own ontology or we're going to use something that's already existing. So, we're going to borrow some, some existing ontologies. And then there are three parts of the ontology building process we have to consider. So, generating the ontology structure, so the classification system, populating the classes with instances, and then refining and maintaining the ontology as new information comes in or things change. So if we borrow an existing ontology, there are lots of open source ontologies out there. There are some small specific ones, there are some big general ones. And with linked open data, there's lots of useful information there. So we might ask ourselves whether we really need to create our own new ontology. Um, we don't really want to reinvent the wheel if we don't have to. The problem is that typically existing data out there isn't a good fit for a particular use case um, or particular data. So trying to fit um, our data and our use case into existing ontologies, we had a look at lots of existing classification systems and we found that it just couldn't fit together with, with our data and with each other. Um, so trying to unify the different ontologies um, is, is quite problematic. They don't all use the same notions, for example. So we decided to create our own ontology, and this way it would reflect our needs and our data. Um, and that seems like it might be quite easy. Jing Yi's already talked about you know, how we might go about these things. Actually, it is quite hard to do. Um, one of the key things is depending on having good data as a starting point. And this isn't always the case, because the data might reflect well um, your application and your domain, but it doesn't necessarily um, it might not necessarily be good for actually building an ontology. These things might be very different. And typically, creating ontologies from data automatically, they end up a bit lopsided. So you find that data in some areas is much more concentrated, it's much better quality than data in other areas. So your ontology isn't really even. And this is a real problem. So your ontology can easily end up being a kind of dumping ground for all your data, unless you know how to organize it properly. And quickly, it can turn to a kind of complicated mess. So in NOMAC, um, what we found is that uh, clustering techniques, such as LDA, um, they work very well in a closed domain um, or a specific kind of text. So already in the field of publications, many people have used clustering techniques to come up with um, a hierarchical set of topics for the publication area. The problem is that we've got all these different text types um, in very open domains, and it's very hard to use these kind of techniques um, when, we're, when we're moving to um, lots of different data, and we're also trying to match with the user queries, which don't necessarily fit the way in which these topics might be constructed automatically. And the ontology is going to change every time the data is updated. And of course, people are publishing things all the time, new data is coming in. So the ontology would change automatically. And this would not be any good for our kind of tools. So we want to start with some kind of existing ontology structure and then expand it. So this is why we ended up using unsupervised learning only for the ontology population and not for the structure. So we actually created the structure semi-automatically. Um, and, and manually actually curated a lot of it ourselves in order to be sure that we had something good. So there's two related problems. One is how to automatically populate the ontology with keywords from a large corpus. Um, and secondly, how to classify our new documents according to this ontology. And both of these are a multi-class classification problem. So we use the ontologies to connect the information. So here we've got a sample of, of some of our ontology. And what we've done is to link it up with our known um, data that's our known ontologies that are out there. So for example, we're here, we're linking to things like SCOS and DBpedia. And these have lots of useful information in. So we're making use of all this information um, that's already available. But we're connecting it to our own ontology. So what we do is we create an ontology of topics representing key enabling technologies, KETs, and societal grand challenges, SGC, which is our, our target domain. From these, uh, and we do this from our existing classifications. We use things like policy documents. We asked expert users for their opinion, and we took existing data. And from this, we constructed the, the, the topic hierarchy itself. 
Then what we do is we need to populate it. So we automatically generate collections of keywords. So for this, we use NLP techniques, things like term extraction and word embeddings that Yixingyi has just described from a large training data set um, of all the kinds of data that we have. And then we use ranking and scoring algorithms to decide which topic we want to match these keywords to, which are the best keywords, and which are the best keyword combinations. And then for each document, we need to decide which topics best fit it. So this is our document annotation process. And this is based on our keywords in our ontology and more scoring algorithms. So we create the ontology structure with uh, classes and subclasses. We add extra information, so descriptions, links, alternative names for the same thing from our existing data. And then we populate it with lists of terms associated with each class. So here's an example of a bit of the ontology. This is just a little faceted search, so you can see the structure of the ontology. So on the left, we've got the higher level classes, such as energy, climate change, bioeconomy. And then as you go across, we've got um, subclasses and so on. And then associated with all these classes are sets of keywords. Uh, and again, here's an example of the ontology showing links to further information, descriptions, and so on. Uh, and again, here you can see the classes, instances, and properties. So we can add whatever um, things we want. So for example, here for the climate change and environment uh, class, we have keywords from existing project um, data. Um, again, we have links to SCOS, we have provenance information, we have descriptions of, um, of the topic, and so on. So here's an example of the ontology population. So we automatically generate keywords from things like class names, from descriptions, from related information, um, using term recognition tools. So these are um, these kind of keywords that might be generated are the things highlighted in yellow. And then we enrich these using word embeddings. So we start with an existing set of keywords, and we use our word embeddings in order to enrich them to find other words and terms which are similar to our starting ones. And then we know that they're also should be associated with the same class. And then we score these according to how representative they are of that class, so whether they're really a good fit or not to that class. Um, and we also generate prior probabilities um, using PMI, point-wise mutual information, for term combinations based on the frequency of co-occurrence. And this means that if two terms occur together frequently in a training corpus, they're more likely to be similar. Um, and so this basically adds support, supporting evidence um, for the fact that they're, um, they're a good fit for the class. So here's an example of, uh, of the final output, which is annotating the data with the topics. So in the big yellow box, we have an example of um, patent. Um, and then we basically we extract, um, uh, we match it to topics such as RNA vaccines um, using keywords like agent, protein, and vaccine, which are found in the text. And then this leads us to annotate. So we get lots of topics and keywords. These are scored. And then we pick the best ones. So in this case, it might be industrial biotechnology and health are our, our final topics. To sum up then, the, the kind of ongoing challenges with this. Um, inconsistencies. So the ontology design has to be tailored to the user needs, but these are not uniform. So when we asked the users what they wanted, everyone said different things. Everyone had different kind of ideas about what an ontology should look like, what kind of questions they wanted to know, what level, what depth um, they were interested in. So for example, if they're interested in very high level topics like health or very, very specific topics. So we had to try and model this into, um, into our ontology design. Um, and again, this is partly why we needed uh, manual intervention at this stage. Automation is a big problem. So the ontology-based approach does require some manual intervention, in our case at least, um, both for the construction part and the population part. So even when we were generating and scoring the word embeddings, we found that some, some of them are not good. We get some anomalies come out. And so we have to, manu we have, to have a way of trying to filter these. Um, so we ended up um, devising various methodologies for trying to, uh, trying to filter this. Um, and a certain amount did have to be done manually. Um, but obviously, we want to minimize that. Evaluating is a problem. So it's really hard, actually, to know if your ontology is good enough or 
when it might be good enough for, for real use. It's really hard to evaluate because, again, everyone has a different idea of what it should look like. Um, and it's, it's hard to tell if you have millions of documents you're trying to annotate. Um, you can only look at a subset to check whether they're correct. And you have to determine things like weighting mechanisms and cutoff thresholds and so on. So this is quite tricky to do. So um, in terms of the future, um, what we've, we consider the, the, the best way forward would be to try and integrate as much as possible some existing classification and modeling approaches um, with our kind of semantic based approach. Um, and then to try and expand this to new kinds of topics and new data. Um, I'd like to just thank you again to the three uh, panelists, uh, Milko, Xingji, and Diana. That was very interesting, very comprehensive. And we already have uh, a good couple of questions. And so we're going to start off with uh, Raj. Thank you. My name is Raj Kumar Singh from Micraft, New Delhi office. To know more on uh, re reinforcement learning. Yeah, well, reinforcement learning, I mean, uh... An easy way to think about it is games. I mean, you, you do a move and uh, each move sort of gives you a different position. So in, in reinforcement learning, uh, you have a state. It's a state in which you are. And then you have a different set of actions that you can take. And each action provides you with a kind of reward. So each action puts you in a different state that has a different... Uh, reward or let's say um, note or how you say uh, uh, vote or, or let's say like money and the, the whole idea is to um, explore the environment and find which are the states which are the better and in reinforcement learning you have different uh, ways for instance if you take a, an automatic vacuum cleaner who goes around the house and starts bumping into the walls and what it does it sort of basically builds a map of the house saying okay here there's a wall so my reward is really bad so I have to go on my right and there there's no wall fine I'm gonna be cleaning and in reinforcement learning it's it's really this kind of step doing these kind of steps and at the most elementary level you you're doing very simple actions but sometimes there are other artificial intelligence or machine learning algorithms that are used for each step. So it's really a way of putting together different techniques. But the main idea is that you're doing actions. You start in a state, you do an action, and this action gives you a reward or let's say a price or something or a value. And depending on this value, you decide to do go one place or the other. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Milko, and thank you, Raj, for your question. Um, next, we have a question from Eric. Yeah, sorry. So this oh, is Eric, yeah. Eric Antesana from Bayer Well, first of all, thank you very much for organizing this, and thanks to the presenters. It was very interesting. I had uh, two questions. The first one was whether you guys could provide some examples of machine learning or, let's say, this, this kind of uh, uh, tools or, of, or things that we could use in agriculture. It would be interesting to see from your point of view where you could see some potential niches of applicability of this kind of, let's say, technologies. That's the first question. And the second one is whether you could also highlight the main limitations that machine learning, deep learning, I mean, these kind of things nowadays have what once we are trying to apply them. So that we let's say we we are careful on on not just running the algorithm or just downloading a tool here and there, things. I mean something that you you have seen with with the experience you have, so that we could be a, a little bit much more careful, so that we could apply them in a much better way. So I can I can partially um, answer the, the the first question. Um, you might uh, well, I guess. Machine learning um, for, for kind of for, for doing stuff with ontologies, if you like, in agriculture. Um, I mean, agriculture is not really specific in this sense because these kind of technologies can be applied really in, in any field. So the, the idea is really the same. Um, so 
anything really that involves um, trying to analyze documents which are connected with agriculture. So already in, in the project I described, we have a whole section on, on agriculture um, and various topics associated with it. Um, We've worked a long time ago, we worked with uh, the, the, the FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, and they have lots of um, big ontologies. So one of the key problems is that there are a lot of ontologies out there. And again, I kind of hinted at this during my talk. So there are a lot of existing ontologies. They don't always necessarily fit any particular use case or domain. Um, so in this project with the FAO, one of the problems is that there were many different ontologies describing the same thing. So we're looking at things like fisheries, for example. So there was a nice um, uh, ontology of fish, and then there was also um, information about um, types of fishing and so on, and there was information about um, there were news documents, there were all kinds of things. And these things weren't necessarily linked together in any way. So we used a bunch of, of, of machine learning, mostly at the time, actually not machine learning, we used um, some, uh, some NLP techniques, um, but this was quite some time ago. Um, but the problem essentially was trying to link everything together. So mapping between different ontologies is a key area where you might use exactly these kind of techniques to, to understand that, you know, that the same uh, topic is, um, is linked in, from one ontology to another. Um, so there's a big area in, in, in ontology mapping and merging. Um, so this is one key area where um, a lot of work has been done already, um, but still ongoing. Um, uh, so there are a lot of, lot of opportunities there. Um, and as I say, just linking any kind of information together. Um, so linking unstructured information from text, linking structured knowledge bases, um, and linking existing ontologies um, together is um, all these are kind of key areas where uh, these kind of uh, technologies are, are really useful. And they, they are being used to a certain extent already, but there's still plenty more opportunities. I don't know if Milko has uh, anything to to, to add particularly, but uh, um, hopefully that answers your question somewhat. Well, the only thing I can come gets in mind is that uh, agriculture today is getting very much automi automated. So, you know, uh, I, when I was working in uh, Agropolis, uh, there were a lot of conferences where you had a lot of people having uh, solutions with drones that would go onto the fields and uh, sort of provide information on the state of how the plants are growing, um, the, the kind of humidity, et cetera. So that's also an, an area which is quite uh, important, especially when you have a lot of big, big, big fields and you don't have enough people to actually go and look at things. For instance, especially um, pesticides, uh, how to put pesticides only on the plants that are really actually uh, have a disease and not just you know, spray everything. I think that's a little example that is another that could be in agriculture. Okay, great. Um, thank you both. Thank you, Diana, and thank you, Milko, for that. Um, we do have a question. I would just like to uh, remind you guys that we are going to be recording this, or we are recording this, and it will be played again and used as a reference. And Milko, you had a question also that you posted. If you wouldn't mind um, asking it, and then if we can have Dario just respond, because we won't be able to capture that otherwise in the recording. Thank you. Okay, okay. Yeah, my, my question was this. I mean, we're uh, with, when you're dealing with ontologies and, and sort of text mining, etc., there is this whole task of um, tokenizing the language, meaning you have words, but then you have to have the relationship between these words. Now, I don't know Chinese, but I imagine that if you if you do the same thing in Chinese, I don't know, it must be completely different that, than we do in, in a sort of Latin languages, etc. So, how do you deal with that, is there some kind of way, is there some kind of language compiler <laughs> that gives you sort of a object code, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of giving kind of computer terms, that would allow you to sort of uh, merge these, these uh, tokenizers in a more easy way? That's basically my idea. How do you deal with different languages when you're doing uh, text mining, et cetera, et cetera? 
That's a, that's a very good question, actually. So, um, the, yeah, the answer is that for, for, for tokenizing, and actually one might extend that to, to other things, because typically for um, even the things like word embeddings, you might want to include even part of speech tags and so on. Um, but, but going to tokenizing, um, so you have to, do, for, for Latin languages, then typically the tokenizers will work reasonably well, the same tokenizer. For other languages like Chinese, you need specialist tokenizers, essentially, um, because um, the, there isn't the same notion of, of white space between words. So typically you need, um, you need language-specific tokenizers, at least for certain languages. Um, so for example, in the, um, in the gate toolkit that we develop here in Sheffield, um, we have tokenizers for various different languages. Um, so we run the tokenizer over the text, um, and then we have a standard representation of tokens. For each, so each word is associated with a token um, via annotations. And then, so then at, at this point, once you have the tokens, then then you're good to go because you have a kind of standard representation for for the words in any language. But yes, so you do need to, to customize the tokenization for different languages. And as I say, this gets harder if you want to also want to include things like um, part of speech tags. So for example, whether something's a noun or a verb. And this might be useful input for your word embeddings. Um, Xing, you can probably elaborate further on that if, uh, if necessary, but does that answer your question? So can I add, sorry, yeah, can I ahead, add one more thing? So <clears throat> yeah, um, nowadays, uh, in the, for example, in the name entity recognition in Chinese, uh, it's not necessary uh, tokenize the Chinese. They are more like end-to-end, -end, we call end-to-end -end, um, algorithm to process it. We can do also, we can directly uh, use kind of uh, BIO labels in the Chinese characters. Even in the English, there are lots of algorithms now. It's end to end. It's, you don't need necessarily tokenize English because there are all some kind of uh, ambiguity in the English tokenization. Like, for example, the dot. Dot may, maybe means the end of the sentence or the digit in the number. There are also some kind of ambiguities. So, so there are uh, more and more algorithms used end to end, I mean, I mean the character level, uh, like any entity things. Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you all. Um, I'd also like to invite, because we have some additional comments and also responses from one of the participants. Dario Valori, are you on the line? Would you just want to comment a little bit? You had some responses and some additional comments that would be useful, I think, for the group to hear. Yes. Um... Hi, um, this is Dario from Bioversity. I, well, I was commenting on the issues related to uh, word embeddings that um, uh, I guess we have to expect. Um, and in particular, uh, for, for this, uh, while I was hearing about uh, the end-to-end -end translation, I think that uh, uh, that works, but uh, essentially something that is um, it will go out of fashion because. Um, between languages, the best way that we understand now um, the translation is that if we can identify uh, the thoughts that are behind a certain uh, phrase, so that you can, for example, match map from one phrase in English to three or four in Chinese or by visa. And then you can also use, you have people, mute people that uh, communicate through gestures, and uh, you have also to um, have their input um, matched with the, with thoughts and eventually translated into another language. So we have to go through the thought uh, area. Um, words don't make it, um, are not good enough because you have to get the context on, and the context can, can come from several phrases, uh, a, a series of phrases uh, in, in a sentence. So um, that's why I was citing a work by Jeffrey Hinton on, uh, on foot vectors, uh, which um, are quite promising, and uh, they would allow. Uh, he, he describes uh, in in a couple of papers this uh, this kind the, the potentiality of this, uh, which he thinks is uh, quite promising to bring to the next level, not only natural language processing but also 
creation uh, by by machines of uh, um, stories um, uh, and, and so on, poetry and so on. So that, that goes much beyond um, the language translation itself. So there's a lot of potential, but he itself Inton, describes it as uh, requiring very powerful machines and he hopes in the next few years this will become um, available and Google is working actively on this to be able to understand uh, more profoundly what people are searching for. Thank you. Thank you, Dario. Uh, very appreciate your, your comments. Um, did anyone have any reactions or anything to add on that from the speakers? Okay. If not, um, we, we think we have about one or two questions left um, given the time. I'm going to hand it over right now to Elizabeth for a question. And if there's anything else, please be sure to add them in the comments or let us know if you would like to add a question or a comment before we finish out the webinar. Okay, hello. Um, so um, I feel like being the less uh, technical person here. I have a very practical question that uh, CGIR has been uh, collecting uh, thousands of um, surveys, socioeconomic surveys and mainly those are interviews. And I have a concrete example of some interviews that have been done with farmers and consumers for describing why they prefer such a crop uh, for their use, uh, either for planting or for eating. And uh, socioeconomists were asking uh, how they could at best extract concepts about the traits of the crop, knowing that we already have uh, some ontologies and uh, would it be possible to directly extract the concept from the transcription of the interview, which is called a verbatim, where you have all the sentences translated the way the person pronounced it and uh, provide a list of preferred traits for a variety out of those uh, mm -hmm. unstructured data in Excel files. And then it's also a bit linked to the last discussion because most of the interviews are done in several languages. So I understand it's not yet there, but is, can machine learning help us doing that on a more automatic way than now it's to, done manually? Thank you. Yeah, Thank so, you. Um, so, so I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that that we're doing. Um, so extracting concepts from from this kind of unstructured data. Um, there are a number of issues. Um, I mean, the, the first the first problem is actually trying to understand what you want to extract because you may not even know exactly what the things are that you want to extract. Um, so if you do it in a kind of unsupervised way you might end up just with a rather arbitrary set of concepts. Um, so the question, what do you want to use them for, is, is quite critical there. So you have to be kind of very sure of what you want to do. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so I mean, there, again, there are these problems that you really, typically you might need a lot of data. Um, this might not be a problem, you might have a lot of data, but you need a lot of data and it needs to be representative in some sense in order to um, to make some sense of it. Um, but again, Jingyi can probably um, elaborate further on this. I don't know if you have any thoughts, Jingyi. So oh, I yep. think this is basically, um, uh, as I uh, described in the uh, first few slides, is like name entity recognitions. <clears throat> so um, uh, can I ask a question is like you want mapping the concept between the ontologies or you don't have ontology you want to find the concept automatically for the crop traits we have ontologies but uh, they are not very elaborated but let's say we have a list of, of concept that has been validated and we would like to use it to extract the traits from the unstructured data okay so um, so basically the, the first step is we can using kind of, um, of course, the name entity recognition method to find the words. But the, another thing is we also need to do some kind of another, it's still a classification task. We need to do the classification over the concept uh, of, the, of the terms. So basically we need kind of, still kind of need kind of human 
uh, labeled data to train this kind of um, uh, machine learning model to do this? I'm not sure I'm answered your question on this. I think it's it's the kind of question that actually needs <laughs> it, it needs quite a lot of thought and, and and discussion in order to to answer probably what what you really want to know um, in more detail because uh, we need we would need to know exactly you know what you have and what you want out of it and so on so it's hard to answer um, very quickly but hopefully that's given you a, a kind of idea anyway of uh, um, yeah thank you thank you thank you also for for the responses. Okay. Um, I think we see another comment in, 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 the, in the boxes from Gideon, I believe. If you want to in, unmute yourself and just have yes. your, state your name. Good your morning. Name. Greetings Hello. from Mexico. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, I'm part of the CGIAR platform for big data and agriculture. I lead the community of practice on socioeconomic data. Uh, we're in the process of developing an ontology for socioeconomic data, which is one which is really tricky because it's extremely varied and very, um, um, uh, and, and there is nothing there yet. So we're basically starting, uh, uh, starting from, uh, from, uh, from scratch, uh, using, uh, making use of existing ontologies where that is, uh, where that is possible. But um, it is a very, very, very tricky, uh, very tricky uh, process. Now, um, in, at the same time, because uh, we're dealing with data um, that is extremely has, uh, has been extremely difficult to ma uh, to make interoperable, uh, because there are no standards, there is no. Um, um, uh, it's a mixture of structured, unstructured, and semi-structured data. Um, uh, we've been uh, we've been developing a uh, a metadata schema to capture uh, the structure of uh, of data, the, uh, um, which means that um, uh, this process uh, is quite uh, we're we're quite advanced in that. So at some point we will have a uh, a way of um, capturing the information uh, uh, of uh, turning um, the our data sets. Uh, into um, uh, uh, to providing structure uh, structural metadata with our uh, with our data sets, um, which will still need to have ontology terms attached to them. Uh, but because we put it into a very structure uh, structured way, would that then uh, allow us to um, uh, to 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 uh, to use these types of um, augmented intelligence tools that uh, that were described earlier during the webinar uh, to extract uh, extract and build the ontologies uh, from that uh, from that uh, from that information uh, because um, yeah so it's basically doing pre-processing on uh, on your data uh, in order to be able to uh, to get uh, uh, to build uh, to build the ontology and um, and what kind of things would it uh, would it take uh, to uh, uh, to make uh, to make that more more uh, more useful? So again, I think it's it, it's hard to to answer um, without knowing more of the specifics. Um, but in general. Um, it sounds like you're, you're you're going down exactly some some sensible steps. So, in it, the the answer, as always, is kind of it depends a little bit with with your structured information. But assuming that your structured the way in which you've structured your information is kind of helpful for for the ontology process. So, for example, if you've got relational information in there, if you've got things like the entities and the relations that we talked about, um, or at least some degree of that, and if they either match already your ontology structure or can be made to map to it, then you're you're kind of at least halfway there to, to the problem of, of mapping to the ontology. So, in general, I mean, the more structured the information, the easier it is for NLP tools to, to be able to process the information. Um, the only problem is if it's structured in such a way that's, that's, that, that doesn't map to what you're trying to do. Um, 
but but I would assume that the, that it, it's it's done in in a way that's kind of helpful. So in a very general sense, um, the more structured it is, the in general the better, because uh, the, the the easier it is to get meaning out of it, and the easier it is to um, to know what what what's important and what relates to what and how, which is basically what you're doing with an ontology is is you're understanding the structure of the information. Um, so, in a general sense, I would say uh, um, that it's, it sounds like a sensible idea. Um, in terms of what else you can do, um, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's a very that depends very much on you know the specifics of of your data and so on. Um, again, I don't know if if Xingyi or Milko have any suggestions uh, there at all. Um, it's, I say, it's a bit hard to say without knowing the details. Um. Thank, you. Thank you, Diana. Milko or Xingxi, anything to add? Maybe not? Okay, great. We, we are at time, so I, I, I want to just close this up right now. Um, I want to thank again the panelists for joining us and really have spent a, a really good amount of time before getting together. We had a few meetings. We really went through the content um, to really prepare for today. And we hope that all the participants um, were able to uh, engage and learn something new. And, and like we said, um, there is a link. If you go back into the comments section of the Blue Jeans, we have noted the link for the LinkedIn community. So feel free to click on it and join. And that way you can continue to receive information um, on this group as we continue to evolve and have more discussions and, and also look at other topics to review for these webinars and, and other types of activities. Um, thank you also to the participants. I know we have, uh, we were unable to introduce everybody. We have about 43 people online. And I know uh, we had Gideon just mentioned he's from Mexico, but we have everyone from all parts of, of the world online. So we would just want to thank everyone, whether you're waking up or about to go to bed uh, for joining us. We try to find a time that's good for everyone. Um, and then just a special thank you to the team that coordinated, um, led by Elizabeth Arnault, who leads the ontologies crop um, crop ontologies community of practice, and she's a scientist here at Biversy International here based in France. Um, and also Celine Aubert, who is a coordinator of this series and also supports Elizabeth. Um, and so thank you again to everybody. If you have any final questions or comments, please note them. We will take them offline and try to address them if possible. Um, Elizabeth, do you have any final closing remarks? No, I, I want to thank you all for this very interesting webinar. I think this will be a very good reference uh, document to we will put online. And I hope uh, that our members who were asking questions about the use of machine learning for ontologies have found some answers. And then we wait for you to be connected to our next webinar. We will inform you about the next topic and the date. And thank you, Aman, for your facilitation. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day.